Welcome to another edition of Coonrod's Corner, brought to you by the Rogers Corporation. Today's topic, understanding DK measurements at millimeter wave frequencies. Now here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, welcome to Coonrod's Corner. My name is John Coonrod and I am a technical marketing manager for Rogers Corporation. Today I'm going to be talking about understanding DK measurements at millimeter wave frequencies. Now, of course, there's a lot of test methods out there, and uh, there's many test methods that can determine the dielectric constant, or DK, of a material. The term I'm going to use today for dielectric constant is DK, uh, but that really refers also to relative permittivity, or also epsilon sub r. And as I've already said, there are many different test methods out there, and these test methods are defined by different groups sometimes. So IPC has, I think, 13 different test methods to define DK. Uh, IEEE has some test methods, ANSI has test methods, universities, OEMs, there's no lack of test methods out there. And of course there is no perfect test method or we wouldn't be talking about this today. This video will be an extension of a video that we've done a few years ago on the same topic except it was not for millimeter wave and that video was called Common Test Methods for Measuring Dielectric Constant and it was a short Coonrod's Corner video. And the pictures that we're looking at now in the upper left is uh, the clamp strip line test and the bottom left is the split post dielectric resonator, upper right is the FSR, full sheet resonance test, and then the microstrip differential phase length method. All of these were talked about in the previous uh, video, but specifically the clamp strip line test is what we use in our QA department to define the dielectric constant as a raw material test, and the microstrip differential phase length method, which I'll talk about more today, is actually a test using a circuit as a test vehicle and extracting the dielectric constant. There are two basic categories for testing uh, materials for dielectric constant. One is a raw materials test and the other is a circuit test. And these names are pretty indicative of what they're doing. The raw materials test is a test that usually uses a fixture or some kind of setup to test the raw substrate itself. And then the circuit test is normally when somebody makes a circuit out of our materials and from circuit performance they can extract the dielectric constant. Now of course these two different types of tests have different influences that impact the accuracy. In the case of a raw material test the fixture and the setup itself has some uh, different influences that impact the DK accuracy and in the case of the circuit test of course making a circuit there's different variables that will impact the performance of the circuit and ultimately how you extract the dielectric constant. So it's not a good idea to compare test results for dielectric constant from a raw material test compared to a circuit test. And the reason why simply is that these two tests have different influences that affect the accuracy. And the same comment with the tolerance. So whatever tolerance is defined by a raw material test, if it's plus or minus 0.05, then you can't assume that same tolerance if you're testing the exact same material in circuit form because the circuit form test has different influences that impact the accuracy. There is no industry standard test method at this point for testing a raw material at millimeter wave frequencies. Uh, the IPC committee that I'm on, the IPC D24C, we are looking at many different test methods to extract the dielectric constant from a raw material test. And specifically, we're trying to evaluate the z-axis or the thickness axis of the material. Now, there are some test methods out there currently that does the uh, testing of raw material at millimeter wave frequencies. One of them is called a free space measurement, and that's showed in the, uh, the picture that I'm uh, currently presenting here. And uh, really what it is is a pretty simple test where you have two antennas and the setup is such that you will do some kind of calibration or reference uh, before you input the material between the antennas. So basically it's an empty test, just free space or air as the reference, and then you put the material between there and how much the uh, center frequency shifts or other attributes, then that's uh, going to tell the user what to expect for dielectric constant. Now, that test is really evaluating the XY plane of the material. It is not testing the Z axis or the thickness axis, which is actually desired. It's still a good test method, and it can be used for uh, looking at anisotropy or how the dielectric constant behaves in an XY plane, but typically the Z axis is what's uh, desired for RF designers. The test that I've shown here is a waveguide perturbation test. It's a rectangular waveguide, and what you see here is two pieces of rectangular waveguide with a window, and initially what happens is you test the uh, full structure all put together with the window being empty, and that's the reference. And then after that, you put material in the window, test it again, and the frequency shift will tell you something about dielectric constant. And it's actually pretty accurate. Uh, there are a lot of tricks to doing this type of test method to get accurate results, but it is also uh, giving you the dielectric constant or the DK in the XY plane, and again, not the Z axis, which is preferred. 
So there are several test methods out there that can test the raw material at millimeter wave frequencies. However, most of them, or all that I know of, is actually tested in the XY plane. For circuit evaluations, uh, there are actually many different ways to do circuit evaluations to extract the dielectric constant. Uh, and just to uh, cut to the chase, so to speak, I think what I'm going to do is just talk about the two that are used most often. So the ring resonator test method is actually employed a lot in the industry for determining the dielectric constant and also the microstrip differential phase length. So to begin with, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some different ring resonators and I'll explain how these are used and what kind of results you can get from them. Shown here are three different sets of ring resonators and they're all microstrip structures. Uh, the one on the left is a microstrip edge coupled uh, ring resonator and really what it is is you have feed lines coming in from the left, feed lines from the right and there's a gap between that and the ring. And at lower frequencies, let's say 10 gigahertz, maybe 12 gigahertz, this is actually a pretty good structure to use for accurately determining the dielectric constant of a material. As you get the higher frequencies, there's more problems with the structure. And specifically at millimeter wave frequencies, what typically happens is uh, these feed lines are open-ended structures and they will resonate on their own. And what very often happens is the feed line will resonate at a resonant frequency in the vicinity of the ring that wants to resonate and they will, basically the feed line will disturb the ring resonance. Uh, so that's not desired obviously. And in that case at higher frequencies there's several things you can do. One is you can make those feed lines much, much shorter so the natural resonance will be a higher frequency not to disturb the resonance of the ring. Or another idea is shown in the middle ring resonator which is actually a microstrip ring in the ring area. Anyway, it's microstrip. But it's also gap coupled with feed lines being tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide. The tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide, uh, if designed correctly, will allow the, uh, the ring resonator and the feed lines not to resonate on their own. And also it will minimize any kind of spurious modes. So this allows uh, testing at much higher frequencies and has been used at millimeter wave frequencies. And then finally, the ring resonator on the right, that's actually a through line with a ring edge coupled to it. So it's, just, it's really just a line from left to right of the circuit only, and then there's a ring placed very close to it. And at certain frequencies, that ring is going to resonate and draw energy out of the line. And the industry uh, buzzword for that, I guess, would be a suck out. So basically, the ring pulls energy out of the through line and causes a dip in the insertion loss curve. These different ring resonators actually will have different responses. So what I've done is uh, shown a screenshot, actually a couple of screenshots of how these different ring resonators respond and what you should expect. Shown here are two screenshots of uh, two different ring resonators. The screenshot on the left that is the background shot and also the zoomed in shot is a gap coupled ring resonator and this is with a granite coplanar waveguide feed line and because of that you can see that I'm getting resonances at pretty high frequency. Actually the zoomed in frequency is around 78 gigahertz and you can see it's pretty well behaved. It's set up to have uh, half wavelength resonances on increments of 10 gigahertz. So it's 10, 20, 30 all the way up to about 80 gigahertz. In this case it's centered in about 78. Now the screenshot on the right is the uh, ring resonator that is edge coupled to a through line. So what you would normally think of for a through line is just a straight line basically across frequency that has a slight negative slope. But in this case, the through line has a ring right next to it and at a certain frequency that ring will want to resonate at a half wavelength or multiples of half wavelength. And when the ring resonates, it basically sucks energy out of the through line and causes a dip. And you can see these multiple dips at different frequencies. Again, I've zoomed in to one dip at 78 gigahertz. And once you have this information and all the geometry associated with the circuit, you can put that into field solver and extract the dielectric constant pretty accurately. Now let's look at another circuit test that's pretty common in the industry, and that's the microstrip differential phase length method. Basically what it's doing is taking two transmission lines that are identical in every way except for physical length and extracting the dielectric constant. And this test method has been around for many years, actually many decades, and uh, it's not a new test method obviously, and it's been tried and it's understood pretty well. So this is an interesting test method, and we actually use that here at Rogers a lot to get a wide band response for dielectric constant versus frequency. Shown here is a more descriptive view of the microstrip differential phase length method. And as I mentioned already, this method is actually uh, pretty simple. You're just looking at two different transmission lines that are designed exactly the same in every way except for physical length. There's usually a 4 to 1 length ratio that is used. And uh, they are 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines and they're typically side by side on the same piece of material when they're built to minimize any kind of uh, material variations. The procedure for extracting dielectric constant from these transmission line circuits is relatively simple and I'll give you a quick overview of that procedure now. 
The formulas shown here are actually from left to right. The formula on the left is the microstrip uh, phase response formula. And all we do really is just simply adjust that to account for circuits of two different lengths, delta L, and then we measure the circuits at frequency F. And what we're measuring is the S21 uh, unwrapped phase angle for the short circuit and the long circuit, and we look at the difference as the variable delta phi. Once you have that, you will have the measured effective dielectric constant of the circuit. And then what we do is uh, we actually will destroy the circuits that have been tested and do a microsection at very high magnification and look at the exact geometry of the substrate for thickness, the width of the conductors, the thickness of the conductors, things like that. Once we have all that information, we put it into a field solving software and we have the software determine what the simulated effective dielectric constant is. And then we tell the software to keep changing the dielectric constant in the software until the simulated effective dielectric constant matches the measured effective dielectric constant. Once that happens, whatever DK value causes that match to happen, that will be the DK value associated with that frequency. Then we'll increment the frequency to the next frequency and on and on and on. And what we get is a table of information or a chart of dielectric constant versus frequency. Shown here in the graph is the output of this microstrip differential phase length method when testing a 5 mil thick circuit based on CLTE-XT laminate. And you can see that I've got a very wide band response. This is going from about 33 megahertz to 110 gigahertz, which is about as wide as I can measure. Actually, I can get down as low as 10 megahertz, but anyway, you see the point here that I can get a very wide band response showing dielectric constant versus frequency. Now, to be straightforward about the whole thing, I personally think that this is a test method that's relatively accurate, uh, but it's not as accurate as a resonator test method. So there are two different types of test methods in the industry for uh, testing a structure, and one is a transmission reflection test method, which this is, and then there's resonator test methods, which I've talked about on uh, some of the graphs a few back. So what happens is the resonator test methods are really focused at very discrete frequencies, and you get a much clearer response, and you do get a more accurate dielectric constant measurement from a resonator. But this type of test method with the microstrip differential phase length, it's also relatively accurate, not quite as accurate as a resonator, but it's a good approximate way to look at dielectric constant across a very wide range of frequencies. And we use this so we can tell customers what the dielectric constant behavior is on this material at whatever frequencies they may be interested in, in this case, from 33 megahertz out to 110 gigahertz. This concludes this episode of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you're not already a member, join the Rogers Technical Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more Rogers Corporation informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Rog mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.